the man that asked, Mrs. Russell, would you stand here with my wife for a picture? Puts it off and sets it on the banister. Mm -hmm. Does another picture. And then gets this when they do their waiting. I think those days there's three minutes and then finally pull and I see that. He had a very curious mind. Uh, it's terrible didn't take it. No, 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 let's just see. He opens it up and it's Walter Russell standing. Michael Hudick, thank you very much for being with us today. This is June eleventh, two thousand and six. We're in Cleveland, Ohio. You're the president of the University of Science and Philosophy. And that has everything to do with chronicling the life of Walter Russell and his wife, Leo. Yes. Who is Walter Russell? What was, or maybe his top greatest contributions to human culture? His top greatest contributions? Well, he was a master of the five arts and science to begin with. That by itself, he's often called the Leonardo da Vinci of the West. Uh, unknown in many uh, circles, but often, and most often, you know about what his creations were, whether they be uh, in music or architecture. He was the original designer of the Hotel Pierre and the Hotel de Artis in New York City. Um, he was masterful in his artwork and won international awards by the turn of the century, meaning 19th to 20th century. Walter Russell was born in 1871 and uh, died in his 92nd birthday in 1963. Here in America? Uh, yes, he was born in Boston, and uh, and he died uh, in Virginia at his uh, uh, home in Swannanoa at the uh, intersection of the Skyline Drive and the a palatial palace called Swannanoa, where all of his consummate artwork and his sculptings of his life creation uh, were on display as a, as a museum. Walter Russell uh, was. I feel the consummate portrait sculptor, uh, bus sculptor of the 20th century. He did the definitive sculpting of Thomas Edison and Mark Twain, and he was the official portrait painter of Theodore Roosevelt, official sculptor of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Amongst his friends were such people as doing uh, the sculpting of John Philip Sousa, General MacArthur, uh, President uh, George Washington, and uh, definitive sculpting of, of uh, George Gershwin. So, uh, but that's just a sliver of the story of this man who seemed to be equally, if not more, accomplished in a multitude of other areas? Yes. The world of science, of which he probably has had the, the least uh, world recognition, but the world gleamed uh, tremendous advancements due to the knowledge that he gave. And where did this knowledge come from since he had practically no formal or a very limited formal education? Walter Russell was not educated formally past the age of eight, nor was his uh, wife, Leo Russell. Um, he felt that uh, the nature and God was his, his greatest teacher. He, required a great amount of time of always being with nature. From the age of seven, he began having, in the birth month, May, his uh, birth month, he'd seek aloneness with nature a great deal. And in that seeking aloneness, the first experience he had of illumination was at age seven. What does that mean, the uh, illumination? I went off on my own of great a great deal of study to find out what does that experience mean. Walter Russell will tell you the scientific understanding of what illumination means, whether it be Jesus. You know, God's, uh, Jesus said God is light. A uh, man of his time could not comprehend 2,000 years ago when we're worshiping golden calves of, of what that truly meant. But Walter Russell gives scientifically understanding. He literally says it happens. It's an earned experience, by the way. And he said it happens in the pineal gland. Between the two lobes of the brain is where sits the center of the connecting electrical connection. Now, how did he ever to figure that, that consciousness? out? Well, because he didn't need to figure it out. He had the experience of it happening. So you know in that experience, in that oneness, where that center of that spark literally came from because it's all an internal experience of being in that 
one light. You've used several words to describe this, but one you didn't use is enlightenment. Would that apply? Did, did he, was he a man who occasionally became increasingly enlight, enlightened through no work or effort on his own, except to put himself in nature? He will quite frankly say, because it's an earned experience to begin with, he, he had worked on it. He had worked on it in, in incarnations of life. Okay. And no different than Jesus, no different than Paul on the road to Damascus, uh, no different than whoever Shakespeare was, or Francis Bacon, or uh, Spinoza, or all these great ones where we say he was in the light, or the illumination, or enlightened. Mm -hmm. This experience which thrusts one, th takes them through the color wave spectrum. You know, we just recently in our history of humanity have even known that we only see about 10% of the color wave spectrum with our, our eyes. Now, the inner experience of the color, color wave spectrum from the ultraviolets to the uh, uh, infrared, you're taken through that color wave spectrum into the two, com the complete one light, breaking what the Buddha says is the illusion of this entire experience. Uh, this is sort of like a projection, a movie projection, and you are your own projector in your... So in you're suggesting we have the capacity to do this, but most of us mere mortals don't have the practice of doing this? Uh, you, I, I refer back to it being an earned experience, but you can certainly within this life, that's what meditation really is all about. Most people never know where they want to go in meditation. Um, Walter Russell says it's the most difficult, arduous work one can ever uh, perform is meditation with the greatest results ever from it. Again, an inner experience, you're going to that one light. And that, in essence, is saying God, or the completeness of love, or as Walter Russell's message was, balance. Mm -hmm. And when he was in that communion, it said, if humanity needs two words, give them to balanced interchange. And what's the interchange part of it mean to you? Well, let me finish in the third, for the third word, uh, rhythmic balanced interchange in all actions, in all transactions with uh, your fellow man and nature. Remember, that's all you ever have to work with from the one, nature and man-woman. You're saying that he earned this, and you weren't re referring to this lifetime that he last lived, but his previous lifetimes. How does he seem to have, how did he seem to have the, the knack for realizing his earned understanding, and many of us presumably having lived many earlier lifetimes, don't seem to have this knowing. We work to acquire it through academics and experience. What's well, interesting uh, that you ask that in light of uh, him saying not a formal schooling past age eight. Uh, his true teacher was uh, nature. Uh, the earning of it, um, or, the, or the working on it in, in this lifetime, I'm not sure Walter Russell, as a, as a, as a young child, uh, gleamed anything more except an ecstatic enjoyment of an inner communion of feeling wonderful uh, as he's mm -hmm. with nature. When this, every May in his, of his, uh, that which was his birth month, and saying that he needed to retreat uh, to be with nature and being alone, he said nature was his guide. One of his earliest books is called The Book of Early Whisperings. And he said, nature whispered. He said, nature is a very jealous God. She shall only whisper her secrets to you alone um, in private. And that's what he asked for. When he was the age of 14, he was pronounced dead from the bubonic plague, a closed, charred, blackened throat by um, the president of the New York Academy, a medical society knowing his family and his parents. So his parents are there and the medical doctor, and he is pronounced dead. In his words, he said he was taken through the color wave spectrum and thrust into this one light, and this communion said, you are to return. You have very important purposes. They shall unfold to you. And he returned, uh, basically not understanding why his parents are standing there and the doctor, but a completely pink in throat. And he said he knew from that point on that he was different from his other little friends. And, um, 
and, and acted accordingly of demanding time with nature. Uh, music had unfolded with Walter Russell at age two and a half. He could play anything in the piano that he heard. Um, and that was the first glimpses to his, to his parents that we have something uh, possibly very unique as our young child. He, he was so creatively. So you said he died in the 60s? 1963 on his 92nd birthday. So I'm going to ask, mm -hmm. uh, there's so many ways to go. Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure where to begin. It's scratching the surface the best I can leads me to think about asking some questions over and over again. Why do so few people seem to be aware of this gifted genius? Because they live in, in uh, uh, body sensing rather than mind knowing, uh, I, I feel is the ultimate. He says, you know, all genius is uh, self-bestowed and mediocrity is self-inflicted. Uh, it is human nature to not want to know the truth and to be pretty lazy of ourselves. Why isn't our education system more inspired by his accomplishments and teaching them on a regular basis? Well, number one, I think it would flip them upside down and inside out uh, with a new washing for themselves of, uh, instead of parrots of information to fulfill slots in society of what we want, we just need more attorneys now, we need more <laughs> doctors now, fill the slots. Do and they question his history? Do they question his accomplishments at all? Educators, people who are out there trying to instill not just why the country and the world needs more lawyers and doctors, but why we can profit from some truly enlightened souls who walked among us in a very contemporary time frame to many of us. I, I think there's always these uh, pockets and areas where one can go to glean that kind of, uh, of uh, learning, education, an inner education, but not of most of our major institutions, including turning out most of our, our scientists. Of course, our scientific world is, is raised to keep uh, very separate from God when our history, uh, or religion, when our history says that there's a far more commonality of oneness in, in our history of, of those two fields. What kind of a spiritual man was he? Well, I would say is the ultimate in spirit. Walter Russell, uh, in their teachings, um, and these teachings are, are called the, uh, it's a home study course teaching universal law based upon uh, natural science, expressing a living philosophy. The purpose was to teach the science of man. They said it's the gleaming, the least known science on the face of this planet. We know more of everything in our science of which the one we know the least of is the one we should know the most of, the science of humanity, of being human. Um, and this, was a, this is a place that would give you a full teaching. They start out teaching you scientifically uh, a meditation and scientific answer to prayer. First time I had ever heard someone speak scientifically of their illumination. He breaks down uh, a, a stages of humanity of reaching stage four of being awareness of oneself, and the fifth stage of genius, and the sixth stage of cosmic consciousness, and the seventh stage of Christ consciousness. You know, you can add up all the geniuses that we have known in our conscious history. Um, and you will probably not come up with a number over about 200 people that have given the greatest effect of, of their gifts of this reaching mm -hmm. that stage and level. Those that have reached cosmic consciousness, of which I feel uh, Walter and Leo Russell uh, both were, and uh, such as people such as Paul, um, that is the stage of illumination of the inner experience of illumination. When they say Paul's on the road to Damascus and this light happens, well, I, I always used to wonder, what's that mean? Burning bushes, whatever, outside, but the understanding of that it came from an inner light, literally as I address scientifically from that pineal gland, mm -hmm. uh, that it's that spark, that flash of uh, throwing you into a oneness, this oneness, breaking this duality. This gift of awareness and oneness he had I'm going to guess the answer to my next question is no, that he didn't subscribe to, nor was he an advocate of any particular organized religion? Uh, he, he was raised uh, in an organized religion as a young boy and found it mostly uh, appalling of what he was basically taught, mostly from an Old Testament of uh, killing and damnation and, and uh, sin and evil. and. Um, 
So in their teachings, they actually, they, they go to the purity of, these, of all the religions. They address uh, Krishna, they address uh, uh, Buddha as the teacher, or Muhammad, or uh, Jesus as the Christ. For me, in my understanding, when I read them, it was, I received the greatest clarity I, I had ever had of who this one Jesus was, who would have a lineage that had a, uh, of all these incarnates earning this point of this in time of coming as the one the chosen one the to be the Christ is a 360 degrees literally of inner illumination so that the one before you would be the walking light truly understanding the power of the scientific when he said he could move that mountain or er erase that mountain I now comprehend inside that if we have the consummate scientists of the entire history of humanity then that power literally sat from within on this outward manifestation to alter anything Michael in our limited time I'm going mm -hmm. to probably try to push for as many responses to as many questions sure. as possible and I I just love where all of this is headed, and it sounds like something that would attract almost anybody who sees or hears this story, because in my estimation, so few people know anything about his life. How did you become attracted to him? Mm. And tell us about being the president of the University of Science and Philosophy. What is that? First, how did you become attracted? Uh, I was given a, a, a first. I had an experience. I had my a death experience, uh, an experience in a car wreck where I had been going 30 years in my life thinking I was doing it very fine with everything very well. I have a wife and children, and I'm a pharmaceutical salesman, and I, I'm and I'm a pretty cocky, egotistical son of a gun, making uh, a good living. <laughs> And uh, in, a, in a car uh, experience where I thought for certain I was dead, I flashed so quickly into a light, uh, in, in one light. I knew, and this experience, by being in the light, it is timeless. So that my experience was so very short a period of time, and I could know that because when it was over, we're talking about, about a, a 30 second experience where it can, completely was life changing when I went into that timelessness. Many people who've had near death experiences say that what lasted only a minute in chronological world time right. could have been years uh, in that time space. It was everything. I had a canister, a film of my entire life that was, uh, I didn't even know what a flash of a second even meant. I just knew that it all was before me. When it was over, I sat there and I, for the first time, was looking at, at color remember the trees and sound. I'd never seen color such as I had. I'd never um, heard sound such as I had. In fact, I had an eye test shortly after that, and I went from about a 2050 in eyes eyesight at that time, at age 30, back to 2015. So it changed you physiologically as well as uh, Absolutely. You know, as Leon Walter Russell said, everything of the body, every single thing of the body is chemical. Well, this is as close as I could say whatever a lightning strike would be. It, it altered and certainly rebalanced things uh, chemically. Had you known of Walter Russell at the time of this life-changing event, life-ending, no. life-changing event? That's right. No, nothing. I never knew anything. Everybody, the Bible to me was basically, uh, I thought the body, you throw that in a trash can, we just do this life once. I'm being very honest with what Were you were an atheist for. at the time? No, I, I, I moved through whatever atheist is. I'm What's just saying, to agnostic and I don't know <laughs> them. And I think I believe, and then I don't know what a leap of faith really means, but I'm having children, and we go to this church, and I'd like to believe these things. And were it, you pretty hard to live with after this experience? You know, in some senses, that probably be the case. I was pretty astounding to my wife to see how incredible these changes had changed who she knew and yet she was seeing no change all what she was basically seeing is someone uh, th there was nothing but good that she was seeing that's why I was so difficult on her of I'd like to say you're crazy and throw you right out the door, but uh, I'm seeing wonderful things of how dietary changes, and you're sitting and you're, you're studying four translations of the Bible, and you're speaking slightly different, you're being more sensitive to other human beings. And she probably realized your sight was improved too. And my sight improved, and so she looked even more beautiful than before. But that is, uh, 
and my children even gleaned, you know, that, uh, boy, Dad is really different. He's, and I was devouring studying, and, and it was changing things in my outer world. And then I was handed a book, um, and it's called The Man Who Tapped the Secrets of the Universe, written by a man named Glenn Clark, who was astounded as I was because he met this man, Walter Russell, who was living at Carnegie Hall at this point in his life. Living at Carnegie Hall? Yes, his studios were there, uh, <laughs> and all his sculptings, and he was still uh, actually finishing the sculpting phase of his life. As he, as I said, he was uh, the official sculptor of, of uh, President uh, Roosevelt at that time. Just a parenthetical question. Mm -hmm. Why was he spending his time on something so material when he had this vast cosmic awareness to yes. pursue with his time? And it's a very good question. In 1921, remember I said he had illumination every single year of his life after age seven. When he reached 49, which would be a seven times seven, he was put in, a, in an experience in the light of an illumination of 39 straight days and nights. In his words, in that period of time, there would be nobody that uh, could approach his chamber door because the relativity uh, was breaking of always of matter. So he was seeing the color waves in our spectrum. And so a body coming near him would just be uh, much more almost holographic and, and could be seen because there wasn't the density to any uh, matter such as we normally are caught in the density of our bodies. The very first thing that happened to him in this illumination, he said, was an absolute command and mandate to write. He wrote 40,000 words called the message of the divine Iliad. He also said those words came from that source, they're not his words. I've seen the original writing pages. Now we're talking about a consummate artist, a consummate sculptor, masterful. But when he was writing, it was like you took a a chicken and stuck his claws in ink and it's very very scrawly uh, and he says he was having such a difficult time of trying to put a command of mind over his body because he was so separated from it the but he eventually did and you can see the change in the actual writing but there never was erasure never a, a pencil mark change to a unnecessary sentence. punctuation nothing to those 40,000 words. You didn't words. use the word channeled. Is, does that, is that to denigrate what this process might have been with him? Or do you think That's this is a fair way of describing how it came? You know, words are hard. They get in the way of what may happen. I don't know. Uh, for me, what this was, you were in such a communion of oneness, you're beyond wor uh, the word of channeling, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, that's the best I could answer. And it sounds like he truly, if you want to use that word, channel all the time. Sometimes Absolutely. with the written word and other times with information downloads of enormous proportions. That's a very good way for this day and age and all of us understanding, these enormous downloads. And, and that's what happened to him in that 39-day uh, day and night period. Those words were written. Then he, he did uh, oil paintings because this was a great artist. And what he started painting, um, and we have all these uh, paintings, these scientific paintings. First thing he did, he painted the uh, solar system, uh, and and the 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 sun, not and the, the cosmos, not so, the universe. Well, he get he gets to that. He starts with the solar system, which was later uh, confirmed by Swarthmore Institute that every one of those planets were in the exact positioning, uh, proper positioning, at the time of this illumination. When he's asked, and then he, he painted Saturn. Now the multiplicity of rings, the beauty of this, of, of this artist putting these multiplicities of colors of rings are, are exquisite. And he has multiple moons around Saturn. At that particular time in 1921, we knew of one moon, best of my understanding, we knew of one moon, Titus. Now, we just discovered all these other moons as we just put that probe through the Saturn rings. I reported on it, but I, don't re but I don't remember reporting on it already being discerned earlier by Walter Russell. <laughs> no, you, you didn't, because... Uh, 
<laughs> well, the multiplicity uh, uh, of moons he has in this oil painting. Then he does many of the uh, of his paintings show the magnetic uh, fields. As Walter Russell was the first man to ever use the word electromagnetic wave universe in 1921. 21. Uh huh. In 19. So once he had this this array of 40,000 words called the Divine Iliad. He, he's sitting with all these scientific paintings. And I might add, his wife thought he had gone crazy for whatever... Uh, because of his writing of the Divine Iliad? Because or? it was going on. This consummate artist is scrawling all this stuff. He's at commanding and demanding a great amount of time alone. You're all of a sudden looking at paintings that at this particular point in time make no sense whatsoever uh, of color wave spectrums and mag we don't have spectroscopes yet we don't have and he's painting these things well she brought in the uh, attorney who was president of the New York State Bar Association another medical doctor and and said well, he needs to be committed these men come to his chamber and they read the readings that he has been writing and they're looking at the paintings he's painting, and the one, the one said, Mrs. Russell, I, I'm not certain what is going on here, but these words outwit Walt Whitman, and this man is so beyond anything I'm comprehending, it seems divine, and I think he should be left alone. And, and that's really how he was left alone. Now, Walter Russell then tried for six years of studying the world of science, of which he knew nothing about. And in that six years of studying the world of science, with what he knew in the light, he attempted to give forth a new science. In 1926, there's a documented, it's copyrighted, of the elemental chart. He said the chart is nine octave waves, with carbon being right in the middle at four and a half. Hydrogen is the third octave wave. The world of science does not even know that there is an element preceding hydrogen at that particular time. Here's, a, here's an artist and a sculptor trying to give this out to the world. He puts together a manuscript after six years of study called the Universal One. It is sent out to the 300 greatest scientists of our time at that time. That's including Einstein, that's including Robert Millikan, um, 500 great institutions, of higher learning, and he never hears a single reply from those thousand manuscripts. Now, to me, and in his words, it was a crucifixion, again, of this attempting to share with humanity what he felt uh, he knew to help science, to free us in hydrogen, to free us from free sources of, uh, of energy. That was the all in purpose by him. And did nobody pick up on this? Well, not a single soul until he started lecturing at at Union Carbide, at General Electric, and at Westinghouse. And he was given, finally, uh, Westinghouse's laboratory for scientific study on transmutation of elements. The world of science, and, and never giving him really one single ounce of credit, not knowing one single element preceding hydrogen, he tells them what is subsequently found then in the 30s of the heavy hydrogen ions of deuterium and, and uh, 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 the heavy hydrogen, heavy uh, water. Now, why are these things important to me outside of the world of science? Uh, to me, um, the command of the, what this man has tried to share with humanity, when I saw this elemental chart, I felt, you know, when I was in school, when I was taking a science class and I saw that chart on the wall with just bar graphs and numbers saying something has weight to it, mm -hmm. it meant nothing to me, it was dead to me. When I first saw this nine octave wave elemental chart, feeling true that I felt, I'm seeing truth. This is true to nature. But this is after your transformative experience. It's true. Yeah. Absolutely true. There's so much to get to. I'm not quite sure if I had a 10-hour tape, it would be enough. So I'm And just you gonna, wouldn't. I'm going to keep pushing along yes. a little bit. I want to go back to the yes. Divine Iliad for just a second. Sure. <laughs> just a second. <laughs> uh, <laughs> written in 39 days. What, in essence, does it communicate in addition to what you've already said? There's one word that could only be given from his message. It would be balance. I could use the word love, I could say the word God.
Mm -hmm. Him at this scientific point, a man far ahead of his time still, but ready to unfold that century into where we are right now. Uh, his, his message was balance. If two words are needed, this was the direct communion, tell them if two words are needed, give them to balanced interchange. You know, we use different words to describe people who bring this to the planet. One's avatar, one's saint, yes. one's prophet, one's teacher. Yes. Where does he fall into that list? I'd like to have him here to see if he could answer that question and know what you'd say. But I, I do say that I feel that he is one of those rare beings that reaches cosmic consciousness and therefore has had illumination. And he says everything is by degree. But, Christ, but it wasn't for you. You had a snap transformation. Correct, but I'm not sure uh, how how long I was in that light of 360 degrees and then pulled back out of it and down into my body. So you uh, may have been there a thousand years in that 15 seconds. Well, that's a nice way of saying that. Uh, a thousand years in 15 seconds. I'd like to think so, but I, I, I'm not sure. Walter Russell is one, they, they come rarely. I, there's a great book by Maurice Bucks written in 1901. Maurice Bucks was president of the uh, Canadian, Psych Canadian Medical Society as a psychiatrist out of McGill University. He was a friend of, of Walt Whitman. He was coming home from a, an experience of Walt Whitman one night on horse and buggy. He had just lost his son also. He had this experience of illumination, having no idea what happened to him, and studied for a few years after that, trying to figure out what had happened. And he studied these illuminants. He studied Jesus, he studied Paul, he studied Francis Bacon, he studied Emerson. And he came up with, and the Russells were in agreement with, approximately 40 names, if we include Spinoza, Krishna, Buddha, approximately 40 names that had had this experience thrust into a complete light. Now what Russell says, it's uh, from 1 to 360 degrees, that Jesus as the one was a walking light of 360 degrees. And in that light, not coming back the experience of I regrounded back to this body after the experience, was the center light. School of, Co School of Cosmic Consciousness that you had just been talking about yeah. himself. That was a natural outgrowth of his pursuit of understanding of the cosmos? I think it was earned over who knows how many incredible number of lifetimes and a continuing unfoldment in this lifetime with this creative genius that uh, was groomed all the way along, I think, by God from childhood up to this great revelation in 21 to give to the world, and 1921. He, and he wrote the Universal One. Yes, that was a manuscript put out in 1926. And I feel his own personal crucifixion was that no response to this. So that is when, and this is a, an astounding story, he was to do the last portrait painting of Thomas Edison. He called Mrs. Edison in Fort Myers Another gentleman was to do the last sculpting. I still to this day don't know why that, who the person was. They backed out. And he had the audacity to say to Mrs. Edison, I will do the portrait painting and I also do, shall do the sculpting. Now if you can imagine someone to go outside his genius field and attempt, it's like asking uh, uh, Isaac Sterner, greatest uh, violinist, uh, your, your concerto tonight is to on the paint piano, the picture as well. or paint, or yeah. whatever. And he went. He said, I, "I." He says, "I went to Florida on the train, and instead of frivolous with my time away playing bridge or doing whatever, I meditated on the universal source to give me uh, perfection in uh, in doing the sculpting." And it is amazing. The university has uh, owns the last portrait paintings ever done of Edison. And he's very elderly looking. His eyebrows are all over, the cheeks are sunken in and looking whatever I'd Did say. Did Edison have a clue as to who was standing before him? Not in that sense. Uh, a, a great respect of this man, knowing, uh, knowing him.
or the breadth but, uh, of uh, giftedness and, and understanding that he had, not just in sculpting and in painting, but in everything else? I think few of his colleagues of his time, whether they be Mark Twain, Mark Twain brought him into the Twilight Club in 1898. I don't know if any of these people could have spoken beyond uh, words such as uh, an astounding man, maybe use the word genius, but cosmic consciousness is a, a, a rather a not understood even word by most of those we well, Try it again then, uh, in your own words, from your own experience of Russell and your own transformation, mm -hmm. uh, that's not an inappropriate world, to, to just to explain cosmic consciousness. Give me one more shot at it. At cosmic consciousness? Uh -huh. The way he saw it. Well, that uh, this is an inner world inside yourself. We're not in talking that about space. The whether hmm? we're not talking about the external cosmos. You know, everything externally is a manifestation only from your perception <laughs> to begin with. Uh, I, I read a great book, Aldous Huxley, originally, The Doors of Perception, and it was a, and because I had had my ex this experience that all of a sudden color I'd never gleamed the same way. Um, but the first time I uh, studied and looked at Van Gogh and I realized here was one that had to have some great illuminating experience to be one of those first to pull us away from the uh, the, the masters and the darkness colors of the, the first Renaissance round and we were gleaming uh, shades of uh, yellows and golds that we had no comprehension of. And I think those things actually aid us then in our outside world that we start to keep seeing greater color of the color wave spectrum. I've got a thousand questions. I'm going to keep interrupting you because I'm just so yeah. excited about all this yeah. subject. Does autism have anything to do with his giftedness? Or maybe it's the other way around. Uh, I hear these stories of these... Uh, savant, uh, exactly, uh, mm -hmm. and, and people wonder where that comes from. Could he have been autistic? I, I, I've never been asked that question that way, and I'm not sure I would know how to give an answer. Uh, <laughs> but do you understand the, the, the purpose behind the question? Yes. Is there a relationship there to what we think of as the rare individuals in our culture who are who are pegged as being autistic and their gift for genius, at least in some areas with some of these people. I think there's a, break, a great break that can happen from in mind knowing to uh, um, a chemical composition in the brain or certain synapses that, that do not fire uh, as correctly, but there are other ones that have just such tremendous uh, a strength, literally, of those synapses connecting, but there may be a separateness on mm -hmm. on mind and knowing and uh, so then we get confused on this side of the fence with mm -hmm. everything because of of brain and brain chemistry and I'm sure I'm confusing you by interrupting you all the time but I want to ask you yeah. uh, because I've heard about it only in brief and that is his relationship with Mark Twain yes um, Walter Russell was uh, a, a friend of uh, Mark Twain's close friend of, uh, of Twain's in 1898, there was a group of men. Um, they had their beginning in 1878, a group of poets. They were composed of Mark Twain, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Walt Whitman, Oliver Wendell Holmes, John Burroughs, and Herbert Spencer. Herbert Spencer had just come from England. He had just written, written the book, Decline of the West. He had come twice in the 1870s. Um, Herbert Spencer brought together these other poets. They would meet at homes such as Andrew Carnegie's home or Adolf Ox, the founder of the New York Times. And they would spin these ideas and thoughts of a great document was written called the Poet's Code of Ethics, which is copyrighted now by the University of Science and Philosophy. And these men uh, would glean the great thoughts of uh, helping advancement. Now Herbert Spencer was very worried at the uh, we were entering, we were in a gilded age. We were approaching the turn of the century, but he also felt, as he wrote the book, The Decline of the West, that we were ready to plunge in a, a tremendous abyss. And he was far more correct than that of the wars that have produced 100 million people dead within a century mm -hmm. from our wars. 
Uh, by the 1890s, uh, these group of men were expanded to some of the all uh, movers and shakers in New York City. These men created this kind of energy in a group called the uh, Twilight Club. They would meet at twilight at each other's homes. They created the Lion's Cub. Soon a group of men from Chicago came to say, what are these men doing here uh, that are helping their community? And saw that they rotated. They went back to their community in Chicago and started rotating and called themselves Rotary Club. Huh. And hardly anyone in Rotary Club will ever know their true origin and roots that, That's it, huh? that far. And then uh, they created the Boy Scouts of America. The Better Business Bureau was started by them. The elimination of the first sweatshop child sweatshop and labor laws uh, in New York City. The next thing Mark Twain then brought in 1898 Walter Russell into this group of men to be president of them. Shortly as we entered into the 20th century uh, and we were gleaming into World War One, this man building movement, this science of man building movement, went into cessation through World War One. As it was re kindled, Walter Russell brings in Thomas Watson, the founder of IBM. Mm -hmm. And the two of them co-chaired this co-presidency of the uh, Society of uh, Arts and Science. Thomas Watson said to Walter Russell, he said, you know, I think we can use the, the, the sales classes and the executive officers of IBM to teach the science of man. And uh, Walter Russell uh, Thomas Watson says back to Walter Russell, he said, Mr. Russell, please know, this is the world of business. You cannot use the word God. <laughs> and uh, Walter Russell said, Mr. Watson, be assured I will be teaching them the Sermon of the Mount without them having any comprehension that that's what's happening. He was pretty good at euphemisms. Then, huh? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that, that phase uh, passed. Thirteen years he lectured to IBM, all sales classes, all executive officers. And then the next phase, was Leo Russell coming into this picture? She's from England. She she came to New England, uh, and and it was about a 40-year-old woman, 44-year-old woman. And the way she met Walter Russell was the little book, The Man Who Tapped the Secrets of the Universe, by Glenn Clark. Also, she was handed this book, and she was head of the Boston New Symphony. And she was handed that book, and she said, uh, "I knew my life was ready to change forever." That moment and she called Walter Russell at Carnegie Hall. And before she completed her first sentence, Russell interrupted her and said, where are you calling me from? And she said, Boston. He said, please secure me a room. I'm coming to Boston. I've been waiting to hear this voice my entire life. Because of the way he was sounding on the phone, what she intuited, or because of what she read in that book? She was intuitive before the, uh, the minute the book uh, touched at her. She, in England, uh, uh, Leo, of course, I previously mentioned, never gone to schooling past age of eight. Much like him. <laughs> Correct. I had seen her paintings uh, after my meeting with her that began at age four and a half, her seascapes and waterscape uh, watercolors, and they are... I, I knew I was before something at the least of a genius when I saw those paintings for the first time. She said she tried to get to America twice in her life. She felt there was an equal mate uh, here that she was to give messengership with. She had started her writings uh, very young. She was, uh, and they were never published. Then yeah. she was quite a uh, spark plug of her own. I remember reading from, uh, I think, what I had uh, been given by a friend about uh, the Russian Nikolai Tesla, yeah. whose grand scheme was to take the best of Russell and put it in a time capsule, not to be opened for a, a thousand years. If that's correct, why did he intend to do that? And tell us about the story of how Russell's wife intervened after he died. <clears throat> well, you are correct that uh, she was a spark. <laughs> uh, uh, and she, um, I don't know where to begin quite. But Tesla was also uh, part of this uh, amazing group of men at that turn of the century. And was he part of the Twilight Club? He was not in the Twilight Club. I, I, Tesla is very interesting to me. I've read Tesla's uh, uh, autobiography. It's only a 60-page book. <laughs> you would love it. Uh, it. It's also 60 pages. And in there, I know he's born in uh, Yugoslavia or, or 
whatever is the area. Nobody surface. just saw you point to the man behind me when you said you no, would love it. No, but, but I would love it too. Yeah, <laughs> correct. Go on, I'm sorry. Uh, when te Tesla had experiences where he would actually see images and negative imagery inside, and they subsequently were events that happened. A barn burned down, and he, and he would see these so things. he was foretelling the future. But I, Tesla never had a grasp, I don't feel, of illumination of why these things were happening to them. There was not a God connection to that with him. He, he thrusted himself into what gifts of knowing on electricity uh, that that would glean. But he was a contemporary. They would eat at Delmonico's at times. Well, Russ would put out... The manuscript, The Universal One, he shared it with Nikola Tesla, and that's when Tesla said, I think you have the answer f of the ages, Walter Russell. So why would he want but, to go, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, that you are so far ahead of your time that this should be put in the sceptre at Smithsonian Institute for a thousand years. That sounds suspicious to me. Suspicious? Like maybe he was envious or jealous of this man's accomplishments that were far greater. That could be the truth, and I don't know if anyone ever uh, truly know or gleam that, but I don't think he truly had the same kind of comprehension that Russell did of this this gift of this inner life. But why bury it for a thousand years if you didn't <coughs> think you had that? Well, I think Tesla had already gone through his own hellacious uh, trying to give forth the knowledge he did uh, on electricity. I mean, uh, remember, this man at the turn of the century is saying that uh, we can gleam electrical energy right through the Earth. <laughs> now, I don't think he had ever comprehended we could go to satellite and back, but he sure understood those principles that so few did, and he knew that he was given his own crucifixions trying to give out uh, the battle of mm -hmm. direct current and alternating current, and well, he did win. No, Russell died, and we're going to be all over the board of this, so I'm just bouncing around. Sure. His wife caught the drift of what Tesla's plan <clears throat> was, or intention was, and she rebelled and quashed that move to encapsulate the understanding of Walter Russell for a thousand years for all the obvious reasons we can guess? I think there's a little twist to it, your understanding. Uh, uh, Leo Russell, by, by meeting Walter in 1946, never knew Tesla, knew nothing until Walter Russell would share that story with her. But Walter Russell had never taken the universal one out of manuscript for not just the reasons of Tesla doing it. He had, he'd sent it out to the world. He was rejected with that. So that's when the sculpting phase of his life, he had five phases of his life, 15 to 20 years in each of those phases, the artist, the sculptor, the musician, the science. So there he is at Carnegie Hall, and he is in the sculpting phase, starting with the statue of Edison first. He meets Leo Russell in 1946, so he had been there like 20-some years, probably a little less every year being known by the world. He was starting to really retreat from that. He would still give lectures. He would give glimpses of this knowledge in very minute amounts. Quite frankly, I'll tell you something I didn't share. In this communion in 1921, this illuminating communion, he was told in that communion, you do not give any of this to the world for 25 years. But there's a big difference between 25 and 1,000. Well, the point I'm making is this, that he, he gave out that manuscript, period. Mm -hmm. If he was absolutely <laughs> true to that communion, I, I wish he was here for me to ask the question of, nothing would have been said whatsoever until 1946. And that is the year he finally was ready to release a book called The Secret of Light with some gleaming new insights and and uh, reflections on his first writings. There's a series of, of writings from the New York Times in the 20s, and Robert Millikan writes an article about black holes. Walter Russell's already had the rejection of this manuscript, but, and Walter Russell, and Walter Russell is worldly known at this time, um, you know, artist and sculptor. Well, he writes back to the New York Times editorial page on Robert Millikan's refuting, saying, uh, Dr. Milliken, uh, you were wrong on black holes, in essence. Uh, Robert Milliken wakes about another week and writes back to the New York Times saying, Walter Russell, 
you're a great artist, a great poet, but stick to where you know mm -hmm. your strengths. How dare you have the audacity, da 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 da, to question what I'm saying on black holes? And Russell's right back with another letter refuting. Now, the most interesting thing, this went over like a couple year period of time. And finally, Milliken writes one, he said, Mr. Russell, you may be on to something that is just so far beyond us at this moment, but you may be on to something. <laughs> and that's about as far as it got from a great scientist. <laughs> I, I yes. want to interrupt you one yeah. more time here sure. because uh, it's just too tempting and I can't resist it. The great scientists of his cont yes. period and, and all the way up to today, mm. A, is there anybody else in your awareness uh, like him in contemporary history? And is there anybody like him alive today? And remember to whom you're speaking is a group of us here who, mm. who are... Uh, imbued, let's say, with the teachings of uh, some of the, the great teachers mm. from the East, from India and whatnot, yeah. and many people are in constant pursuit of the truth through the understanding of others. Is there somebody, are there people around today who, in your estimation, have this awareness, this gift? Yes, and I think they're all over the world, and I hope that I'm in a group that, to our degree, we are all having that same awareness that you address as the question. That's why someone such as Walter Russell came, and came far earlier than, uh, and had to, in a sense, have such rejection, because he was so far ahead of his time. But the seeds, that's why that university was created, to say, study these works, read, meditate upon them, know where to go inside. Return back to your outer world and act in, upon your life and affecting others from your horizon with this balanced thinking process, this creative process. And yet this side. university that you talk about, uh, University of Science and Philosophy, mm -hmm. of which you're the president, mm -hmm. and you live here in northern Ohio, yes. how do I put this as delicately as I can as a university without portfolio that hasn't established the traction that most of us think of when we hear the word university today? Am I on the mark or off the mark with that? Well, you're on the mark with the, the, the question, um, and that takes it back to a previous talk where we addressed the parrots that we put out of information basically through our schooling systems and, and basically how we do it. The, the Russells from the moment of the creation said our work is in our written words and please, here they are. Read and meditate. Reread and meditate further. Meditation is just now something that we all have gleams of what meditation is. We daydream or something. Um, but truly a discipline of it, it's just something very still new to America. Mm -hmm. And most even doing it, prayer. Uh, they don't know where they're, we don't know where we're to go. It sounds like the chemistry that you're using in describing what the university about and what Walter Russell is about was to collect the data that's already recorded historically, the words, his teachings, his downloads, I can't even come up with the right way to express it, and then reread it and meditate on yes. it and let that, let that combination stir right. you into a greater understanding than normally you might get otherwise. Absolutely. Not going to take anyone. You'll be a better Christian. You'll be a better uh, Buddhist. You're taking away nothing from any individual religion. Um, it's a teaching of what that light is. Are there truths that he brought forth in his writings that are useful to us in our own growth and transformation today? It sounds like that's an easy yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us more uh, about the truths that he brought forth in his writings that you know so intimately that others who are fans of his, who have studied his writings, know so well, that are useful to us today in our own spiritual pursuit, regardless of what the nature of that is? Well, I th most people live the entire life of never knowing who they are, what they are, or why they are. I think I, I think we go searching for it. If I saw people that know this, I would see a happy world. I would see a world that was not killing each other and had finally learned uh, 
uh, the futileness of, of that because we don't know who we are and we live in fear of that. And so we isolate ourselves to know our oneness uh, as our true oneness. We are all connected by golden fluxes of light, truly. There is no separation from any of us, not anything singularly separated. I, I guess I'm one to just say, this is the time to know this. This is the time to say, why are we still killing one another in this planet? We have internets, we have cell phones, we have instant communication. I hope this is an exciting time, even in the good, bad, and ugly of the internet. But can you understand how some people take issue with that? Because, of course I understand. For example, people, people my next door neighbor never quite had the road to Damascus experience. I never quite had a car accident that knocked me stone dead, mm -hmm. from which in an instant yeah. I realized these yes. truths. I can sit here in respect and awe and even envy yeah. But I, most people don't think they have the first leg up to the understandings that you've been given, for example. Well, I didn't think I had any leg up to anything when this experience happened. You know, I worked very hard from that point on in an insatiable desire to, to, to know the things I'm even saying now. So that without, but, without getting ourselves killed in order to come up to this level of understanding, how do we how catch do we up do? with it? Well, as Walter yeah. Russell said, you most people you would not want an experience of of an illumination and of a of a of a blast of this inner light that, that this is something that you would want to continue to unfold in your life and uh, so that's what i'm trying to do with it and unfold and uh, that inner light in gradual stages it is too much for most most of us humanity aside from the science and understanding of the world from um an academic or science perspective, how has it most changed your life? The understand, the awareness of his teachings. I'd asked uh, from my youngest days as, as a little child, uh, I wanted dynamic answers as to why I, I'm here, here doing this thing and why we're all here. and. And I begged for these answers of who I am, what I am, and why. This is long before your accident. This is from my two and a half years of age and just sitting, just as my youngest daughter told me, she, well, Leo said she used to sit in a hammock. And she said, from the age of two, I used to sit there and I want to change the thinking of the world because it is so skewed. And, um, and, and I have a picture of my daughter in a hammock, uh, was sucking her thumb at about two and a half, and she went on to become a, a wonderful human being and a great artist and very sensitive person. I, and I saw this and it was like, this is my little Leo and I took this picture of her exactly because I knew that's exactly what she was thinking <laughs> of, of what is this universe and my relationship with it. I think it's, we're in the 21st century. I still sit and I'm amazed every time I turn on a radio or a television or use the cell phone or, or uh, turn on a computer and people say cyberspace. but. Why not dynamically start to understand this electromagnetic wave universe, not just leaving it to the world of scientists, for us to know that we are all connected in these golden threads of light? Great point upon which I'm going to say something I've never said before. I'm going to end this first hour and start another second hour with you because it's also endlessly fascinating. Not that we can ever even begin to further scratch the surface, <laughs> Thank but you, it's great. Michael Hudek is the president of the University of Science and Philosophy, a man around whom there are great synchronicities, coincidences, leelas, as some call them, from India, and not the least of which is, or perhaps the least of which is, I found out just an hour ago that you and I graduated from the same college on the same day That's in 1968. Right. That's right. So these and you're adding the year even. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much. And thank we'll you. resume with part two uh, soon. And thank you for sharing us some insights about the life of Walter and Leah Russell. My pleasure.